We all have one or two structures like this one stashed away out of sight. They may not look bad, but they just don't look very good. It seems a shame to keep them hidden away. Welcome back to my channel, and as always, thanks to my subscribers. I have posted half a dozen videos showing how I rebuild and repaint inexpensive freight cars to turn them into realistic models for my layout. Today, I'm going to show you how I turned this boring model into a detailed and interesting structure. This model, J.C. Landry by Walthers, was assembled nearly 20 years ago. I never really cared for the assembled model, and it took me this long to figure out why. The model is built suffers from three fatal flaws. First, there is no subtlety of texture. The clabbered walls are perfectly straight and perfectly smooth. As a result, the walls look exactly as though they are made of plastic. Second, there is no subtlety of color. The walls and the trim are pure monotone colors, which is something you never see in the real world. With the exception of the J.C. Landry signs, which are in the same brown color, there are no signs to add color and interest to the large wall expanses. Third, the building has no details to bring it to life. There are no rain gutters, no downspouts, no telephone or electrical connections, no cracks in the foundation. Even worse, the building was designed to be illuminated by a single light bulb, which would shine equally through every window and door. The overall result is a model that is not very believable. Having identified what this model lacks, I set about trying to correct those flaws. I started by removing the foundation. I knew I would have to trim this part significantly to improve its appearance. Once I had removed the foundation, I couldn't stop. After about 20 minutes, I had removed the outside staircase, the roof, the vestibule, and all of the windows. It took a little extra work, but I was finally able to separate the three remaining walls. Here is the pile of parts that remained. My first task was to add some texture to the walls. I used the very tip of my small razor saw to scratch some lines along the clabbered walls, one board at a time. This is tedious, but by using a metal ruler, as you see here, it took me about 10 minutes to complete one wall. Next, I used the razor saw to score the corner trim and the window frames. When I was finished scoring the boards, I went over the entire wall with 600 grit sandpaper to remove any hanging fuzz from the walls. Then I used my number 11 blade to score some vertical lines and a few random boards to suggest bo joints in the boards. Finally, I used a single edge razor blade to carefully lift the bottom edge of a few boards. Be careful here. Plastic is much less flexible than wood, and it is easy to completely split the detail from the wall. Now it's time to start painting. First, I applied a black wash to the entire wall. I wanted to emphasize the texture I had added to the wall. If you want to model a very decrepit building, you could easily stop here. I wanted to suggest that the building had been painted several times over the years so I applied a wash using a pale yellow color. As you can see, painting with a wash results in a wall with significant color variations. Here is the final wall alongside a wall which has not been reworked, showing the difference. If you want more color in your walls, apply additional coats of wash. Remember to apply several thin washes. You can always add more color, but it's impossible to remove color. I really wanted to repaint the window sashes and mullions. For some reason, they were cast in pure white, which looks unrealistic to begin with, but looks even more out of place alongside the brown painted window frames. Unfortunately, the windows supplied with the kit came as an assembly. The clear styrene glazing was cast as an integral part of the white window sashes and mullions. This wouldn't be so bad if the window parts hadn't been cast in white plastic, but I needed to find a way to paint these parts of the windows to better match the frames. I tried using Tamiya tape to mask off the clear glazing, but this was incredibly fussy and I was not pleased with the results. Instead, I painted Miskit onto the window panes. When the Miskit is dry, I painted the windows 
with Rust-Oleum Painter's Touch 2X Flat Red Primer. This gives a medium brown, which matches the window frames pretty closely. After the paint had dried, I carefully peeled away the misket with my number 11 blade. As you can see, the misket peels off cleanly, taking the paint with it and leaving a clear window pane behind. I textured and painted the other sidewall and the back wall in the same fashion, with one exception. There is a boarded up window on the back wall. It did not make sense to me that the boards applied to this window would be carefully painted, so I gave these boards some additional texture and I painted them a medium gray before I applied the black wash. When the wash was dry, I dry brushed some highlights using a medium brown color. I was never really pleased with the colors on the front of the building. I decided to paint the storefront portion a medium green, retaining the brown window frames and recessed trim panels. So I carefully masked off the building front as you see here. Then I sealed the edges of the masking tape with dull coat, and when the dull coat was dry, I primed the piece with Tamiya Gray Primer. When the primer had cured, I painted the exposed portions a medium green, and then I applied a thin wash of lighter green over those painted areas. Painting the vestibule posed some additional problems, starting with the fact that the vestibule assembly did not fit flush to the building front, as you can see here. So first I glued a small strip of styrene to the front edge of the vestibule to fill the gap. Then I masked off all of the clear pieces, including the window panes, and the brown window trim on each side of the vestibule. Since some of the masked off pieces were clear, I sealed this piece with a glossy clear lacquer that was so any seepage under the masking tape would dry clear instead of cloudy. Then I primed and painted the vestibule using the same green color combination. You probably noticed that texturing the walls pretty much destroyed the original J.C. Landry decals, so I had to create signs for the building. Since I modeled the Rio Grande from Alamosa to Creed in Colorado's San Luis Valley, I decided to rename the business to the San Luis Valley Supply Company. If you aren't printing your own decals, you are missing out on a great opportunity to personalize your models. All it takes is your favorite word processing program, a supply of decal paper, and some clear varnish, matte or gloss as you prefer. I run a test print on regular paper first. When I'm satisfied with the size and the appearance, I print the signs on decal paper. I cut my sheets into 5.5 by 8.5 inch half sheets to conserve paper. If you're using an inkjet printer, be sure to print in normal or draft mode. Printing in high quality mode deposits too much ink on the paper and the decals will smear. After allowing the printed decal to dry for 30 minutes or so, I spray it with two light coats of dull coat, allowing about an hour between coats. After that, trim and apply your decals as you would any other decal. I wanted my sign to be black lettering on a white background, but instead of using white decal film, I printed on clear decal film. I will apply white paint to the building walls to create the white background. That way, I can use an off-white color, or any other suitable background color. Before I masked off the area for the sign, I applied a coat of matte varnish to the building wall. Since I had not primed these walls before applying the washes, I didn't want to risk peeling off any of the paint along with the masking tape. After applying the masking tape, I sprayed a second coat of clear varnish over the masked off area. This will hopefully prevent the paint from bleeding underneath the masking tape. Once that varnish had cured, I painted the background color for the sign. I used vintage white, which is an off-white color with a little yellow in it. I was careful not to achieve perfect coverage. Any of the wall color which shows through will add to the appearance of peeling paint. As you can see here, I used slightly thinned paint, and this turned out to be a mistake. The thinned paint wicked underneath the masking tape in spite of the sealing coat of lacquer, resulting in blurred outlines. I had to correct that with a little touch-up painting around the edges. Next time, I will use a dry brush technique to paint the masked off area. 
Once the background color had dried thoroughly, I removed the masking tape and applied a coat of clear gloss varnish. This gives a smooth surface finish to allow the decal to adhere without any trapped air bubbles underneath. At last it's time to apply the decal. Trim, soak, slide free, apply microset, the blue bottle, position the decal and squeegee out any excess microset. After decal has dried, apply Microsol, the red bottle, until the decal is settled into all of the surface detail. Only after you are completely happy with the appearance of the decal, spray on a coat of clear matte varnish. I use Dull Coat. Once you have applied the varnish, the decal will not come off without stripping the underlying paint. Once all decals had been applied and sealed, I glued the windows in the wall openings and I installed view blocks on each window to prevent viewers from seeing completely through the building. Normally, I use construction paper to make my view blocks. The paper can be removed fairly easily if I ever decide to add some interior details. But the windows on this building are stepped. The lower sash is thicker than the upper sash, making attaching paper view blocks more difficult. So I decided instead to simply paint the backs of the windows. I used a pale green color above to simulate window blinds and flat black below. Next I reassembled the building shell. I attached the vestibule to the front wall. Then I made sure all four walls were square and true and I glued the joints together from the inside, taking care that no glue wicked through the joint to damage the paint on the surface. I inspected all the corners to make sure the joints were as good as I could make them. It might be necessary at this point to fill some gaps with plastic putty. If so, apply masking tape around the gap to keep the putty off of the rest of the model. Sand the putty once it is dry with 1200 grit sandpaper, then paint the repair. The foundation as modeled has a footprint of about 37 by 25 feet. However, the building that sits on this foundation has a footprint of about 31 by 25 feet. Why in the world would someone build a 900 square foot foundation, and presumably a basement based on the windows, when the building would occupy less than 800 square feet? The answer is, of course, they wouldn't. So I cut the front porch off of the foundation, and I removed the plastic loading dock base from the rear and the left side of the foundation. Then I glued a styrene panel into the opening I had created along the front of the building. The foundation was cast with a little texture to simulate concrete, but I added some cracks and some spalling to emphasize that this foundation is not brand new. When I was happy with the appearance, I primed the entire foundation, basement windows and all, with a light gray primer. Painting concrete is a little like painting bricks. You need to use a variety of colors, and they need to be blended to avoid a monotone color. I prefer the wet-on-wet -wet painting technique to achieve this color variation. Regardless of how you paint your foundation, be sure to include a black wash to highlight the surface details. I finish the paint job by painting the basement windows a rusty brown color. I prime the roof, including the glued-on trim, using Rust-Oleum Painter's Touch 2X Flat Gray Primer. When the primer had cured, I dry brushed the brick chimney with terracotta, Tuscan red, and pure orange, and finished with a thin wash of raw umber. I dry brushed a little grimy black at the top of the chimney stack, and I painted the base of the chimney with grimy black. I weathered the standing seam roofing using the wet on wet method. I brushed a little water on the roofing, then I applied washes of burnt sienna and raw umber. I allowed the washes to flow down the roof naturally. When dry, this will look like natural rust accumulation. With the building shell, the foundation, and the roof complete, I test fit the three pieces together. This gives a good idea of how the completed building will look. All that remains is to attach the loading dock, the external staircase, and the front awning. Even though it's still incomplete, this building already looks miles better than before. But this video is already 15 minutes long, and I still have quite a way to go to finish the makeover of this building. So I'll wrap this up for now. 
I have already completed the loading dock and I'm now working on the staircase. Stay tuned for the second and final part of this project. While you're waiting, here is a sneak peek at one portion of the final build. In the description below this video, you'll find links to many of the products and tools I've mentioned. I love to read your comments and to respond to your questions. If you want to see more videos of this type, be sure to subscribe and hit that like button. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.